Hi guys, my name is Mark Law and I'm the creator of Rational Wine, Seven Key Wine Concepts and Consult Wine. In this video, I'm going to talk about vinification. Before anything else, before getting into countries, regions, grape varieties, climates, laws, I think it's important to have a basic awareness of how wine is actually made. Uh, there's a lot of steps in between picking grapes and getting that finished wine into the bottle and having a bit of knowledge behind them is going to help you to think about what you can expect from that wine before you even open the bottle. And also by learning these steps, I think you'll start to respect how much work actually goes into winemaking. Just like milk doesn't come from a carton or meat doesn't come in plastic wrapped uh, packages, uh, wine does not just appear on the shelf in a bottle. Again, I'll try to keep things as simple as possible by using less technical jargon, but there will be a few terms I'll mention because you're going to find them useful in the future. So let's start at the beginning. Number one is timing. Before touching the grapes, before anything else, you have to decide when you want to actually get those grapes in. Because think about it, it's a fruit, and fruits gradually grow from unripe to fully ripe, and if you leave them for too long, they'll become overripe. So, if you harvest your grapes earlier, the grapes will be less ripe, they'll have less sugar, and they'll taste more acidic. On the other hand, if you harvest later, the grapes will be more ripe, they will have more sugar, and the taste will be less acidic. And you will see the occasional bottle with late harvest printed on the label. Sometimes it's in another language. In French, it's Vendange Tardive. In German, it's Spätlese. And if you see any of these terms on the bottle, you can reasonably assume that the wine is going to taste at least a bit sweet. Choosing the right time to harvest depends a lot on uh, many factors like what variety you've planted, the weather conditions, what style of wine you want to make. So this information is a powerful tool for figuring out uh, exactly what the wine will be like before you open it. So keep that in mind. So step number two is harvesting. Once you've decided when you want to harvest, you have to go out there and get those grapes. And basically you've got two ways to do this, either by hand or by machine. And when I say machine, I don't mean that they've got robot arms that actually go out and grab those grapes. Uh, as far as I know, the technology has not gotten to that stage yet. But there is a machine that goes out there, it uh, grabs the vines uh, on each side and shakes it very hard, and then the berries fall off and those are just collected. Now, the advantage is uh, this can be done very quickly and on a very large scale. The disadvantage, of course, is uh, it's very violent and uh, there's the chance you will damage those berries and oxygen will start to get into the juice and that's going to change the flavor of uh, the final wine. So we have to be careful of that. And because of these reasons, machine harvesting is usually reserved for uh, less expensive wines mass market wines and especially wines you find as bag in box. And this brings us to the second method which is of course hand harvesting. Hand harvesting is of course a lot gentler. The harvesters have the option of picking and rejecting individual bunches, even individual berries as well. Uh, but of course it's a lot slower and the cost of labor is more expensive which is why you'll see hand harvesting mainly in the higher quality, higher priced, premium, collectible wines of the world. Step number three is sorting. Now that you've harvested your fruit, it's time to uh, take it into the winery and you want to pick out exactly how much of the fruit you want to use in your wine. Again, this is uh, done by machine or by hand. Uh, if it's by machine, it usually sends the fruit on a conveyor belt. There's a high-speed camera, and the camera is trained to reject any fruit that doesn't fit the profile of uh, what wine you want to make. Any fruit that's rejected can be blasted away with a jet of air. Uh, the other method, of course, is to do things by hand, manually. You spread out your fruit on a sorting table, and you have a team of people going through with their eyes and their hands and just picking things out manually. And it's not just fruit we are focusing on, we are focused on matter other than grapes, also known as MOG or MOG, because we don't want any ladybugs or caterpillars or spiders in your wine, you just want to use the grape berries. There is the option of including stems into the wine, and if you see the words whole bunch on the label of the wine bottle, this is what it means. 
Why would you want to use whole bunch? Uh, because this will add some more savoury characters. In my experience, the wine is going to smell and taste a bit more herbal and uh, it's going to change the texture of the wine as well. It's going to feel a bit more heavy on your palate and uh, all of this is for the purpose of adding complexity into the wine because uh, you want the wine to be something more than just uh, fruit juice. You want uh, something more interesting to come out of it and uh, it's going to be more enjoyable to smell, to drink and to enjoy with your food. Step number four is crushing. You crush the grapes to get that juice out and uh, it's on its way to become wine. You've probably heard stories or seen pictures of people crushing grapes with their feet in the old days and the idea behind this is that the human foot is gentle enough to not break the seeds of the grapes. Otherwise, those seeds are going to release some bitter oils and compounds into the juice and that's uh, usually not something you want in the wine. These days you'll see more winemakers using machines to crush the grapes, but with exactly the same purpose. Just doing it gently, very gently, and not uh, disturbing the seeds and uh, releasing those bitter oils. Step 5 is pressing. What's the difference between crushing and pressing? It's the purpose behind it. Crushing is to initially get that juice out of the grape. Pressing is where you actually separate the liquid from the solid parts and that's including the stems, the seeds and the skins. So step six, we're finally getting to fermentation. This is where we finally get the alcohol into our grape juice. And basically what happens is this yeast is uh, going to eat the sugar and as a byproduct, the yeast will produce carbon dioxide and alcohol. And uh, there's not just one kind of yeast, there are many different types. There are yeasts that can tolerate high alcohol levels, there are yeasts that can tolerate low temperatures, there are yeasts that uh, produce more glycerol, which is going to change the texture and mouth feel of the wine. And uh, when a winemaker decides to choose a particular strain of yeast, this is called an inoculated fermentation. And uh, this might feel like you're buying a designed or a manufactured product, but the advantage behind this is you know exactly what you're going to get in the wine. On the other hand, you can use yeast that occurs naturally on the grapes when you harvest it, and uh, we call these indigenous yeasts, and then this becomes a wild ferment or a wild fermentation. You're more likely to see this term on the back label of some wines, so this is something to keep in mind. And uh, you might feel that you're buying a more natural product uh, when you see this, but uh, the risk is uh, the yeast that ends up dominating the fermentation, it might introduce some flavors that are undesirable. So uh, that's a risk that you should bear in mind when you're looking at these wines, but uh, hopefully if they're confident enough to sell them, they should be very delicious to drink. And uh, in general, the fermentation will stop uh, once all the sugar has been consumed, and uh, the alcohol usually reaches by about 10 or 15 percent at this stage. Just a special note, uh, the last three steps of uh, crushing, pressing and fermenting, uh, it will happen in that order usually for white wines. For red wines though, it's usually going to be crush, ferment, then press. This is because uh, for red wines, the color comes from the skins, not the flesh of the grape. So you want to ferment the wines with the skins first, then you press it to separate that finished wine from those solids. So step seven is maturation. So we finally have the wine, but it's not quite ready yet. It needs time to settle and get into character. It needs time to mature before it goes out into the world. And in most cases, this becomes a choice between stainless steel and oak. Stainless steel does not add any extra flavor to the wine, which is great for light, aromatic wines with delicate flavors uh, that would otherwise be overwhelmed by oak. Stainless steel also keeps out oxygen, so you're able to keep that wine fresher for longer. On the other hand, you have oak, and uh, this is used if you do want to add certain flavors to the wine. And uh, when you smell an oaked wine, you might get vanilla, cinnamon, clove, coconut, baking spices, cedar, and all of this, once again, is to add complexity to the final wine. 
Uh, another note is uh, oak is watertight, of course, but it's not airtight, which means it's going to allow a very slow transmission of oxygen into the wine, and this is going to affect both the flavor and the texture of the final wine. Step eight is clarification. So the wine's been matured for long enough, it needs to be clarified before you put that wine into the bottle. And that's because the average consumer expects their wine to be crystal clear before they start drinking it. And uh, why is the wine not clear? It's because the yeast that was used to ferment the wine is still in there. And also during the pressing stage, uh, you were wanting to separate the liquids from the solids, but there might be very small pieces of skin and stems uh, in there. So you want to make sure we take care of that before we uh, put that into the bottle. And uh, to clarify the wine, you will usually perform fining or filtration. Fining is when you add something, which we call a fining agent, to the wine, and the fining agent attracts these particles. It forms larger clumps, and these large clumps will then sink to the bottom of the tank or the barrel, and that's going to be easy to take out afterwards. And uh, some examples of fining agents include milk, eggs, uh, gelatin, and isinglass, which is actually made from fish bladders. So it's important to know this if you happen to be a vegan, because you're trying to avoid anything that uses animal products, of course. And uh, if you're not vegan, you've got nothing to worry about because those ingredients might sound strange, but we are going to remove that out of the wine in the end. Uh, which brings us to filtration. So of course uh, you're filtering uh, the stuff out. You have a uh, filter and it uh, blocks out anything that's larger than the holes in the filter there as well. And you can get it uh, to such uh, precision that it blocks out bacteria and microbes. And uh, that will just make sure that the wine doesn't continue to ferment inside the bottle because uh, once again, there are wines that do have residual sugars there as well, and uh, we don't want the wine to be under pressure uh, when you finally buy it and pop it open when you get home. And uh, occasionally you might come across a wine that does say unfined and unfiltered. So a winemaker might choose not to do those two things because it, uh, he feels it will take out uh, the character of the wine. So how are you going to make wine clear without finding infiltration? Uh, so we use sedimentation and racking. Sedimentation is basically just a waiting game. You just let the wine sit in the tank and do nothing. Maybe just bring down the temperature a little bit and you let gravity do the rest. Very slowly, everything's going to sink down to the bottom and create a sediment. And uh, once you've waited long enough, you can rack the wine. And uh, that means gently pumping the wine out from the top of the tank into a fresh new tank and uh, leaving that sediment in the old tank. Step nine is bottling. So finally, we're ready to put this wine into the bottle. There's nothing really magical about this part of the process, but it is important to make sure your bottling equipment is clean, your bottles are clean, and everything is free from contamination because uh, the wine might become tainted inside the bottle and you've wasted months of work. And uh, once the wine is in the bottle, you have to seal it. And these days you'll come across cork and screw cap mostly. So screw cap is very convenient and it doesn't let oxygen into the wine. Uh, but there are some designs of screw cap which does allow a little bit. So it's mimicking cork a little bit and you can actually age these wines a little bit better, more similarly to cork. Um, but the greatest advantage of course is everyone knows how to open a screw cap. Uh, these days, more and more premium wines are coming to market under screw cap, so it's no longer the case that screw cap equals cheap wine. So buy a screw cap wine with confidence that you're going to get something very good value. And uh, cork is the traditional closure, of course, and uh, it does allow oxygen into the wine very slowly, and that helps the wine to age in the bottle. Cork closures, uh, for better or worse, they're still associated with more premium and expensive wines, and there's still a certain amount of romance attached to the ritual of cutting the foil, inserting a corkscrew, and smoothly extracting that cork. 
but of course the main disadvantage is uh, if you've never used uh, one of these in your life, then uh, it's very difficult, um, you, that's what you'll find, and uh, you're going to have to practice a little bit to be able to use this smoothly and uh, professionally. And another disadvantage of corks is uh, you've got the risk of cork taint which gives the wine a bad smell and it's going to resemble a wet moldy carpet, a wet dog or wet newspaper. Uh, but these days the chance of coming across uh, cork taint has reduced with better quality corks being available uh, but it's still a risk that you should keep an eye out for because the last thing you want is to buy a wine from a shop, take it home and uh, you find out it's tainted. So if the wine happens to be corked, let me be very clear, if this does happen to you, you have the right to take that bottle back to the shop and politely demand an exchange or refund. You've paid good money and you've expected to receive a good product and if that product turns out to be faulty through no fault of your own, you can and should have it replaced. If this happens in a restaurant, you have the right to ask the sommelier or the manager for another bottle of the same wine or pick a completely different wine. This is the reason why sommeliers pour you a taste of the wine before serving it to your guests. It's to give you the chance to decide for yourself if the wine is in any way faulty or tainted. It's not to uh, let you decide if you like the wine. And uh, if the sommelier is doing his or her job properly, then they should have recommended something close to what you want anyway. But if you select a wine by yourself with no outside influence and decide later that it's not what you want and you demand to have it returned, that's just very impolite. The restaurant might choose to eat the cost of the bottle and maybe it can be used later for staff training, but you can imagine if it was a sparkling wine or if it was a thousand dollar bottle, that's just not feasible. In this case, I humbly recommend you to take it as a learning experience. This is a chance to broaden your palate and you can even ask the sommelier for advice on what food would be interesting to try with this new wine. So some of you watching this will have noticed I've skipped a lot of steps. So I haven't mentioned anything about sulfur dioxide treatments, uh, clarifying before fermentation, temperature control, malolactic fermentation, blending, differences in sparkling wine and rosé production. Uh, I skipped these steps because I wanted to cover more general concepts of high vinification and uh, some of those other steps are more specific to certain styles. So I'll cover those in another video. This was a very long video, and uh, thank you for watching to the end, you did a great job. Just to give you an idea, I got my diploma in wines and spirits after two years of study, and uh, this consisted of six units. One of those units we used to cover both viticulture and vinification. So we've covered half a unit of study, uh, about two months of work in just a few minutes in this video. So great job. And uh, the best thing is you don't have to take an exam because I've already done it. So thank you very much for watching. I hope to see you in the next video.